Hello, everyone, and welcome here to the Risen Esports Divine League Winners Finals. We've got a really awesome matchup tonight between the Miami University Red Hawks and 8-Bit Esports. These are the two powerhouse teams left in Divine. They have not dropped the series in playoffs. Miami University hasn't even dropped a game at all, and they are fighting for their right to punch a ticket into the finals. The winner here goes right there. The loser will drop down to the loser's finals and have to win a different series to make their way back. My name is Cole Slot. Joining me on this cast here is Rude Dude. Rude Dude, what are you looking forward to in this series? I'm looking to hopefully some very high quality League of Legends and I'm almost certain that we're going to get it here today to very strong teams having made it all the way to this final we know that there's going to be some sort of prestige some pedigree to all of these squads now as we have already entered the draft the bans have gone out I know we were talking about a few little picks in the drafts that we were anticipating to see here so far on this new patch it's good to see that Hecarim has remained that top dog and we've not yet seen any of those niche jungle picks that got recently buffed no Darius no Morgana just yet but I don't want to be counting them out too early on you never know when the Zed or Diana jungle might just pop up in a series near you of course lots of changes that came in this patch this is really the first organized play we're getting on it so there should be some meta shifts here and there but I mean these teams haven't even had time to practice on it so any any power picks coming out of the new patch would almost be speculative rather than proven. So it's kind of a challenge for these teams to adapt and change up their play style with only really the patch notes to go off of. In any case, we do see some other power picks staying the same. Jinx has been a powerhouse for 8-bit esports. Orianna, always the staple in mid lane. So nothing too spicy yet, as you were saying, but we may see this is a best of five. So there's plenty of time for teams to try out creative and inventive things. There are a lot of games to be played. There's a lot of League of Legends, and that can kind of incentivize drawing something out that you weren't normally planning on playing in a shorter series because there's less risk to uh, cheese is what we could call it. Oh, for sure. And what I'm looking to here is obviously this very early pickup of Jinx and Orianna already 8-bit defining themselves as one of those team compositions that are going to be looking for those team fights, right? Massive Shockwave, Massive Super Mega Death Rocket and the Runan's Rockets coming through from a Jinx can be lethal in a team fight. And that's exactly what we're anticipating to come on through for 8-bit, staking their intentions very early on. And I am definitely going to be interested to see what um, you are going to be able to pull back out in that mid lane i feel like early orianas do give you a little bit of leeway in potential cassidins if you try and set up for it early enough in the draft here and with an ezreal a fairly safe ad carry this is something they can certainly maybe look to here of course very early to try and suggest such a thing as they've also drafted themselves this karma very flexible in its picks can go top mid and support in this draft so far for miami u and Obviously, the Udia locking on in for 8-bit confirms that for the time being, at the very least, the jungle meta hasn't been too changed just yet. Yeah, I'd agree with that. I mean, Hecker of Udia is a matchup I've seen before, believe it or not. Uh, these are two champions that <laughs> really? have been in the jungle a whole lot lately. <laughs> and uh, nothing too inventive there, so we'll have to wait for future games to see if any of those spicy jungle changes make it make things happen. Uh, one thing to point out is that Karma, she was top. She's been support here and there. She has been noted this patch because she can go mid lane now and abuse Moonstone Renewer a little better. That item has been reworked. Uh, Chemcheck Putrefire has also been changed that if you shield an ally, you yourself can apply Grievous Wounds. And so that can make a champion like Karma a really excellent user of it as she can always shield her allies basically around the clock and maintain 100% uptime on that, which makes her a really reliable applier of Grievous Wounds, especially with that supportive item with a little more AP. It's cheap to get and it just provides so much value and it seems with a lot of healing. Of course, 8-Bit don't have much healing yet. I mean, Udyr Turtle Stance is extant, About I suppose. we've got. <laughs> yeah. Potential for Bloodline as well to come through on the Jinx here, but looking at the second round of bans from 8-Bit, I feel like they're essentially setting up for an R pick right here. Irelia banned away, Camille banned away, Irelia from Lucent. Obviously, we had a pop-off game in game number two of last week's series. They also have obviously taken away the Camille, uh, no, another sort of mid, uh, top laner that can go toe-to-toe -to -toe with the Nar in the early phases. They do lock themselves in the Rel here, so recognizing that this Karma is a flex and wanting to take away a top tier support as well gives them even more team fight, even more engage in the Oriano Rel combination during said team fights will be very devastating. Uh, so setting themselves up for that one as well, a very worthwhile support to be taking there. And I like the Thresh ban, the Brawn ban as well to come on through with Jinx Thresh as a bot lane duo, very prevalent 
sort of filling that role of the Aphelios Thresh lane from a few patches ago here. Your Hyper Carry, Hyper Scaler doesn't need that extra mobility, and certainly uh, Miami, you don't want to be giving the Lantern mobility to that Jinx as well. Uh, and recognizing here that there's a potential for a Gnar to get locked in from 8 bit, Miami actually take that one away, and they're going to blind pick the Gnar into the top lane themselves. Yeah, and it's, it's interesting. So we do have lock-in confirmation now with the Rakan that this is Karma mid. So that's one thing to mention. Another thing is that Rel being picked up with Thresh and Brom bands. It's it's Brom not a support we've seen too much too often. Um, and just not nearly as much of a power pick as Rel. Of course, Brom can keep someone like a Jinx a lot safer than a Rel can. He's there for the peel more so than the engage. So we see a really strong engage coming in from 8, but it will leave their Jinx relatively vulnerable in this game which is really important when you're dealing with Rakan, Nar, Hecarim, three kind of dive-in champions who are going to be looking to mess that Jinx up. And with relatively little damage coming out of the jungle, out of the support, and out of this Cho'Gath in the top lane now, uh, I'd be concerned for 8-bit's Jinx. But we do have our first full look at these team compositions. We do see that Cho'Gath top lane being locked in as the answer to Nar. And I mean, it's two teams looking to do relatively similar things rude dude i mean it's team fight on miami side and team fight on 8-bit side for the most part i'll agree with you here what i want to add as a little bit of a caveat to that is that this gnar here has the potential to try and go for a more split push oriented build to maybe try and distract this chogat in a side lane because looking at miami's composition they don't have the greatest tank shredding capability right they don't have that hard hitting tank shred ad carry in the back line quite like a jinx here the ezreal not renowned for his killing off those tanks most notoriously but more kiting them out and sort of drawing out those longer range team fights so if we do see a bit of an adaptation from the gnar on the top side here they do want to try and move over to those side lanes pull out a bit of a split push because i think the 8-bit have got themselves just a very easy to execute very simple composition that they can look to just constantly force those team fights with the rel engages with the cho'gath and a top lane build more towards sunderer blade of the ruin king potentially coming through as a second item here this gnar can definitely take a side lane duel and maybe draw a bit of pressure elsewhere and distract 8-bit from what they really want to achieve with this comp. Yeah, and I think I agree with you because I think Miami's engage, it's it's one of these things that's a little less reliable. The Rakan can stumble over some traps and get CC'd or silenced or stunned by the Udyr or even shockwaved out of a uh, grand entrance and that can really, really stop him in his tracks. The Gnar, of course, has the Gnar bar management, so he only really has the ability to go in and make something happen half the time. Whereas 8-Bit, I mean, send it in the rail, put a ball on her, you're, you're team fighting. It's that Yo, simple. That's it. <laughs> <laughs> it. It writes itself for 8-Bit there. They do have all of these really simple tools to go up on, and obviously the positioning for cleanse on this Jinx is going to be very important because if he oversteps right, Rakan and Gnar and Hecarim, they can definitely punish. They will be able to go close that gap and it's really nice to see that Miami have drafted themselves a set of dive buddies really. You know, if you so often if you draft just the Hecarim to go into the front line with, it sort of detracts from Hecarim's strengths and his core play style where you just want to be diving in using that onslaught of shadows to cause backline issues really. You know, the Jinx with those flame chompers, with the support of the Rel there as well, can quite easily start to kite away if it's just a one-man band diving. They've picked themselves up Nara and Rakan, right? The Rakan able to dance through that team fight, pick up the support in both the back and the front line where necessary. A lot of potential and a lot of onus on Cleave here to recognize where he needs to be in these team fights. Because as the Rakan, you can also play a pretty decent distraction and one of those disengaged tools where you just sort of run rampant in the front of your own team, try and distract the Rel, Udi, and Cho'Gath. You know, a three-man charm on those guys to buy a bit of space for your Ezreal to dance, dash back out and get that timing back to reposition himself. Could very well net a team fight for Miami U. Yeah, and I think it's also just worth bringing up that if the Rel Oriana combo doesn't connect or it can't find multiple targets, there is this issue of kiting going on where this Karma and this Ezreal are going to be able to get away from an Udyr Arel and a Cho'Gath running at them. You have the Mantra Inspire to give a huge shield and a ton of movement speed. Ezreal, of course, always has the Arcane Shift. And so that can make it tough to stick on top of him and make Ibion go down. Uh, if the Udyr is running at Karma Ezreal, Karma Ezreal will kill the Udyr 10 times out of 10 if there's no one there to back that Udyr up. And that can be a problem for them. So 8-Bit need to 
connect is kind of one of the key things. They're, they're going to need to not just find their engage and pull the triggers, but they need to do it effectively. If flashes are available and Shockwave gets flashed out by a couple people or the Rel engage is responded to and that Magnet Storm comes down and everyone simply leaves before they can get Womboed on top of, then suddenly you're running a little low on tools to reclose those gaps and that can spell disaster for 8-bit. And coordination are definitely going to be key for 8-bit, that they are going in as a cohesive unit, making sure they can find these engages as five members, obviously using all of those tools to their greatest advantage. And to get there right, they're going to have to sort themselves out through this early game. I think that they've got themselves some pretty rough matchups, at least on the top side of the map. I know that Karma Ariana in the mid lane is going to be a bit of a farm fest. Push priority goes to whoever uses their spells the most. Most likely the Oriana able to, if she so desires, collect that wave priority early on. But on the top side, right, the Cho'Gath is expected to lose to this Gnar. Go down a little bit of CS early, get pushed in under the turret, and create space for MLBD to really create that space in the top side of the map. Get a little bit of those crab priorities, maybe make some ganks happen as well, which can feed into the mid lane. Maybe burn the Oriana's flash a little bit earlier on as well, and just start to generate these advantages as well here. Yep, and that really is going to be the name of the game. It's who can be proactive, who can find those advantages where they can. I don't think there's a massive scaling diff here. Jinx, of course, scales really well into late game, but Karma and Gnar are both like late game too, especially if this Gnar is going to be pushing in a side lane and trying to generate pressure that way. Uh, he will never really fall behind on this Cho'Gath, I don't think, especially if he builds correctly. So I think this is a game that's going to come down to execution. It's going to depend on who can make things happen, which means that we're going to need to take a quick break so that we can hit the rift and see it all play out in front of us. So we'll be back in just a couple minutes here with game one of the Divine League Winners Finals. Hello everyone, welcome back here to Summoner's Rift for game one of Miami University of Ohio Red Hawks. It's a lot of words versus APD Sports. We got there. <laughs> We've hit the rift, we have level one, we can see items, we can see runes, starting pickups, and uh there's not a lot to talk about, honestly. You know, except I'll, the game I'll, itself. <laughs> I'll I'll buy here. We'll go for the bot lane right now. We've got cleanse. 
with this Conqueror Longsword start on Jinx here. As, oh. oh, you do not like to see those if you are uh, MLBD. They're just not quite finding the Rampage to prevent the recall. Either way, though, I, I like the uh, tier start from the Ezreal down on that bot side. Whenever you pick an Ezreal lane, you know that you're going to be playing to sit back to scale. And the Rakan as well, really going to be doing much the same thing here into the Rel. Not going to be the easiest lane for him, but equally probably doesn't have the worst time either just to try and potentially interrupt some of those engages but you're looking at this tier here to get yourself stacking up nice and early and i will actually be interested on um, to see what mythic item ibn opts into with the recently changed trinity force sits much better on ezreal obviously there are a lot of tanks as well for him to try and cut through so there's a real possibility that divine sundra becomes an option for him if he's looking to go down that particular sheen route here and uh, already if we do have a little bit of a long sword issue in Jinx's pocket could be looking to see if that Noon Quiver gets picked up early and which particular mythic they will go for there. And you know, we talked about it being a rough top side here, Cole, and uh, <laughs> yeah. I think I think we're seeing it in a full force. Divisal man, he just wants to walk towards the wave. It's not allowed. He's just having a bad time. He'll get his creeps. He's got one so far. When the wave pushes in, he'll be able to pick up the rest of them. But that is the range advantage in top lane, you know? You, you think, I'm going to go farm this wave, and instead you get auto attack three times. You're just sad. So I think that's a good sign for Lucent being able to take advantage of it. Bot lane kind of repaying the hurt here with Cleanse and Calcite hitting two first and taking a favorable trade. But nothing too exciting. Both junglers clearing the bot to top, so we may see some fireworks in the top lane here in another minute or two as well. And it is worth noting that uh, Dylan actually skipping out on those Krugs there is going to be ready, sat in position for that crab immediately off the respawn or opting to go back down to his bot side here, right? Obviously already on the Gromp, has enough time to go down to that bot side to make a play happen down there. But with pushing mid, pushing top lane here, wouldn't be too surprised to see a little bit of access through this top-sided Scuttle Crab spawns in about 10 seconds here and you can see the mid laners tussling for priority lucent doesn't really have to fight just because it's part of being gnar into cho'gath and already looking to see if they can maybe make something happen with hecarim already in that brush yeah, here's a gank mid, mid lane calcite roams up at level two blows a flash mid that's all they're gonna get out of it but that's still very worth it you saw cleanse had to recall so calcite just says well i don't need to i'm not gonna go for a cheater recall i can't buy anything so Go mid, burn a flash, punish Pluto a little bit for being pushed up. That's a really solid roam, and I mean, you don't really have to pay much for that. So, key summoner burned. We'll have to see if Thirst can capitalize on that. Really good start off to the bot lane here for 8-bit. They have themselves that little advantage now with double longsword essentially up against a tier. Not really any combat stats on the Ezreal to speak of here. If they're able to keep this Ezreal in the laning phase, they'll be in a good spot. But remember here that Thirst path down to the bot side to get the crab. Dylan path down to the bot side to get himself that Krugs after the recall here. And a 3v3 on the bot side, a very real possibility here. Yep, and you see Ivan spots out Thirst. Now Cleanse, or Cleave has to get out of there. He goes low. He has the Ignite. He's going to survive. Thirst tanks up turret aggro. Gets very low as well. He's actually going to tick down to Cleave's Ignite. That's first blood. And now the chase is on. Can Ivan and MLBD get the rest of it? You see the Arcane shift into Cleanse's face. MLBD is going to get that rel. Ivan oh, no. going to go down to <laughs> Cleanse. And MLBD takes the revenge kill. So that Arcane shift in led to some minion aggro. And it ends up being a two for two. Three? One for three? One three. for three. One for three. One We're for good. three. And, uh... I can see it at the top of the screen, Rude, dude. Why am I confused? <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I don't know, my guy. But, uh, you know, the fancy feet down on the bot side from Cleanse actually got him that kill right there. Able to dodge out on Essence Flux, the Mystic Shot, and then using the Zap as well to get just that little bit of extra damage. Looks like that bot lane play was about to be very Miami U favored. Now, don't get me wrong. It definitely was here. But the kills have gone into the right places here. You've got two on your hair cream. Unfortunately, one on the Rakan. If you're looking at this for 8-bit, that late game hyper carried the Jinx. Able to pick up a kill for herself in response. So whilst it might not have been the best for 8-bit, given that they got two members to go down as without a response, they do still get themselves the kill in that right place and a little bit of sort of solace in the fact that they were able to pick up that kill. Yeah, and I mean, it's it's really well played by Cleanse to realize that there is that chance while MLBD and Cleave are distracted by the rel, just saying, well, hey, I'm a Jinx, I can still do damage, just let me right-click this Ezreal and not stop. And uh, yeah, 
goes down, doesn't isn't able to use the the get excited to get out of there. But I mean, one kill is better than none, and if you're guaranteed dead, you may as well take what you can get. So that's a really heads up play. I like to see that, and uh, it does leave the play a little less of a tilt or a little less unsalvageable than it was because. I, with this Ezreal still building that tier, I think the Jinx actually still ahead in combat stats and in damage right now for this 2v2. It's really just that Hecarim that you've got to worry about. For sure. IBN here has got himself the core fields, obviously with a little bit of ability haste on that as well. He's just going to continue to be able to farm up using those Mystic shots, stack that tier. Not really any sort of combat they were anticipating down on this bot side for the most part. And you can even see with a pushing in wave and first making their way down to that bottom half of the river it does initiate a cloud dragon take for 8 bit they're able to put themselves 1-0 up and then dragons and worth noting here that in the best of three series that we saw last week miami gave up a single dragon throughout the entire best of three and already 8-bit have bested that and all sort of equaled it up to begin with yeah and cloud dragon not a bad first dragon to take it means that you're a going to get a more valuable soul and B, you get that 10% CDR on your ultimates before your ultimates are even really being used. So it can start providing value immediately, which is kind of nice. It's still the weakest standalone dragon, I believe, um, just because only ultimate cooldowns is not that great, especially when you're playing someone like Udyr, who uh, doesn't care at all. But for Cho'Gath, you know, that feels nice. He can get his six stacks on minions a little faster. and that, That'll add up. Anyway, we have an engage here on the bot lane. It doesn't look like anyone's going to go down. Not choosing to burn any summoners. Calcite just going to have to dash on out of there. Yeah, nice big shield as well, just as they make their way out to safety. And you imagine a reset to come through here. They do need to be careful. This bot lane freeze is a very real possibility. They obviously are playing Jinx, so breaking that freeze won't be all that difficult. But I know that IBN and Cleve will be very happy to see the lane in such a good position. And even actually look at this. A bit of a lane swap has come through already from 8-bit. Danizel is down on this bot side. He's going to be there much faster than they would have anticipated. Miami caught maybe a little bit off guard as we are seeing that eight-minute marker. Pretty classic stuff and maybe a little bit of a throwback to the beginning of the Season 10 era when Rift Herald spawns about that eight-minute marker. you got to get going up to that top side. You pull your strong side over there. The more members, the better in contestion for this Rift Herald that we have to imagine is going to come soon with now four of each team on the top side of the map. It's very real. It very much could be that start off toward the big little Shelly creature. Yeah, I think part of the impetus for this, on top of the rotation for the Herald with Dragon Down, is if you just take a look at CS, Denzel is uh, having a bad time yeah. in top lane. <laughs> we haven't had a camera up there very often. Looks like Herald actually just going to go down, so they're able to leverage that lane swap to secure it. Um, but yeah, just getting, you know, two or three waves for your Cho'Gath to safely farm alone without being pestered by that very annoying gnar it's it's a big deal when you're actually down 30 cs at nine minutes that's a that's a serious deficit almost to the scope of two kills in gold which is not what you want to be at when you're a top laner at 10 minutes um no, that is made up a little bit with a mid lane cs deficit and karma as well maybe anticipating to go down a little bit in cs obviously up against the oriana who has a very easy time last hitting the majority of creeps and is a little bit more liberal with the usage of her spells being able to throw out those command attacks very easily we are still seeing a little bit of bot top side focus here say bot because it is indeed the bot laners that have made their way up and ibn here sort of sitting baiting hoping that calcite will take it here just dangling himself as that fish on a hook and Maybe be trying to see if Calcite goes too far forward. There's the Arcane Barrage, MLBD chasing in. The heal comes out from Cleanse, but it is too little, too late. MLBD gonna pick up that kill, try and zoom out. There's an awesome three-person Magnet Storm coming from Calcite, going to make sure that they get the revenge kill on MLBD. Going to miss the flash over the wall. That's going to spell doom. Now you see Cleave going back in onto Thirst. He's going sense. to be able to connect with that charm, but the minion wave arrives. It blocks the Mystic Shot. We have a Jinx Rocket flying in. Don't think it's going to hit anyone. And that's going to leave it at a two for one. Again, plays around this three versus three. The bot laners and junglers looking to combine with one another and force out a bit of a skirmish. Despite the fact that these objectives are going the way of 8-bit, they're not winning out on the fights and the skirmishes. Where the gold lies here in this early game is going the way of Miami. You can see that they've surrounded themselves a 1.5k gold lead already here. It's in this jungle matchup with three kills on the Hecarim. And of course, we've got that big gold lead in the top lane with 
the the Gnar just thoroughly out CSing the Cho'Gath right here as anticipated. Looking at the build, doesn't look like we're going to be getting that Sundra here. It's indeed going to be the Stride Breaker, so a more team fight oriented build path coming out of the Gnar, which does indicate that they're going to be looking to snowball this slight early game advantage that they've got and start taking more and more team fights here. We have a Mountain Dragon spawning in about 30 seconds. You can see bot laners taking their reset. They're now moving back down to the bot side here in lieu of this big objective. I'm trying to see if we maybe get ourselves a bit of a massive 5v5 down here with both of the top laners now looking to take their resets as well. TP's ready and available. This again, setting up for these neutral objectives. And Cleanse there uses the Super Mega Death Rocket just to interrupt the back. This could very well mean that Lucid now has to bend a, spend a TP to get back into this fight in time. Yeah, I think Teleport probably was going to have to be used anyway, but now it's coming in even later, which can be a difference maker. Dragon already spawning in five seconds. The Nar is not even in base yet, so they're going to drop what looks like the Herald in bottom lane, use that to generate some pressure, force someone to respond to it. With that, they're going to turn their attention onto the Dragon. This is spotted out. MLBD is stunned, going to have to use the Onslaught of Shadows just to get out of there. That's one huge teamfight tool not available. It looks like they may still want to contest this anyway. Miami University split. They have 8-bit in between them, but Hecarim can't get into the pit. The dragon getting very low. There's a Cho'Gath Feast as well. The feet dragon goes down. Now the fight's breaking out. There's a battle on three different fronts. It's going on in the jungle. It's going on in the middle of the river. No one is down until Denizel finally falls. There's a two-man shockwave, but it's way too late. Calcite also going to pay the price. It's a very scattered fight. 8-bit was in the middle, and somehow they were the ones who ended up split. They give up two kills, but they get the dragon. Oh, Cleanse could fall as well there, the Scorch. Not quite able to dish down the damage. Fortunately enough, the AD carry going to be able to get back to safety. But yeah, you're quite right here. Despite the fact that they were the ones all congested there together, they split up when the fight matters the most and able to pick them apart. The look, the Karma Hecarim flank, especially without ulti, you might not imagine going to be all that impressive, but playing on the edge of their ranges, they're forcing the engage out, able to sort of absorb that rel combo means that they are able to get away with a fight. Once again, the dragon goes to 8-bit, the objective in their pocket, but these fights, these kills, this gold is heavily now in favor of Miami as Thirst should be able to pick this one up. Yep, you see the Udyr chasing in. The Narhop away creates some distance. There is a turret here if he can get to it. Lucent going to burn the flash, get away from the rupture for the Cho'Gath, going to survive. So it is a summoner blown, not bad on that Nar. It makes sure that he will not have flash up for the next Dragon team fight, for instance, which is where things are going to start getting tricky for Miami, you know? They do have this gold lead. They do have some pressure. They've got the winning lanes coming on, but they've given up two dragons so far. They're not going to get a soul anytime soon. They're going to win the game. They're going to need to really, really win some fights hard to get themselves at least a Baron. Uh, and that means that 8-Bit have plenty of time. They can relax. They can take it slow. And if they can just sneak a third dragon, do the same thing they did right then, the Cho'Gath Feast means any 50-50 is in their favor. And that can put pressure okay. for a soul. Here's a fight breaking out. We see MLBD and Cleave trying to go in, but there is an answer from Calcite dropping the Magnet Storm to make sure it's fine. The Shockwave going to pull MLBD back in, and the Super Mega Death Rocket finishes him off as he flees. So an engage from Miami University that goes a little awry, they end up giving over one kill. A lot of protection to that Jinx does mean that she's able to not only live, but pick up a kill as well. Flash and heal both expended, but of course, with the benefit of picking up a kill, you will always take that one there. A little bit of an overstep, maybe not quite the support that MLBD thought they had. And it does mean that the Jinx able to collect a little bit of gold right there, shutting down that Hecarim as well. Always going to feel good when the play goes awry, putting more gold into this Jinx, who we have to remember is the hyper carry for 8-bit. Is pretty much the sole source of consistent DPS coming out during these team fights here. Yes, the Orianna can have big impact with a shockwave, but that consistent layering of damage is going to come exclusively from this Jinx right here. Picked up the Kraken Slayer now, tier two boots already locked and loaded. This Jinx is definitely ready to start trying to ramp up, pick up some more kills in team fights. And we talked about those team fights being the most important part right now, with Miami having this little lead for themselves. It doesn't particularly matter if they've got a lead if the Jinx just becomes a monster. Yeah, and that, that is something you need to start paying attention to now. The Ezreal actually ahead of the Jinx at this point in time. Ivian has been picking up kills, has a little more farm as well. So this Ezreal is rather strong as well, but it's just a difference between how these two champions operate. Jinx has 
the massive attack speed steroid. She has the ability to pump out huge AoE damage. That makes her a bigger threat. I believe she can generally 1v1 in Ezreal most stages of the game once both champions have two items. It's kind of, she just stat checks him and has way more attack speed. So she <laughs> fires off just far more autos. And that can that can be dangerous. It means that this Ezreal is going to need to skirt range, use that range mm -hmm. advantage, connect with some mystic shots to poke that Jinx down. Uh, and otherwise, you know, if the Rel keeps that Jinx safe, if the Udyr is able to stun the threats, Shogath with silences and ruptures, then, you know, money on Jinx is the big deal. It's it's the huge deal. That's all 8-Bit really could want. So I'm with you on that. It, it can be a problem, even if your AD carries ahead. It's just difference in champions can make it a big difference. Cleave almost getting picked off. Good way to leave there. We are getting to see there in the mid lane just a little bit of what this Ezreal has to offer, though, in terms of that poke, right? And not just coming from the Ezreal as well, this Karma picking up a little bit of magic damage here and there, obviously, with the Moonstone. We knew you got a little bit of AP built on in. You are going to be able to start poking away, whittling down these champions that a bit have drafted for themselves. A couple of nice Ezreal cues when that Mirror Mana finally gets finished off, when the Karma is able to set up for a team fight. We've got a Dragon spawning here in about 10 seconds seconds this is probably the best sort of window for us to start to see how well this poke starts to layer itself down if they're able to get a little bit of that it pre before a team fight a little bit of setup then they will be able to take these team fights but all they've done here is just bully teams out of the river and just walk on in and take this dragon for themselves yeah you see they drop the herald mid actually loose now Jinx going to go far. for the engage the dragon is theirs but here comes the onslaught of shadows cleanse is already dead eight bit need to run for the hills their 80 carries down they have no hope of winning this fight two have fallen to nizzle and calcite are in doing their best trying to find something but it's not there they're going to go down as well the dragon not even finished by miami university they saw the engage lucent said i can cc this jinx cleanse has no flash slams that jinx into a wall picks up that kill, picks up the fight, and then they'll go back and they'll get themselves a dragon. That is a four for zero and a dragon. Miami University blow this game wide open in their favor. And you can disregard everything I said about pre-setting up and poke and everything if the AD carry presents themselves to you there. Just walking right next to a wall in full engage range of that Gnar. Stridebreaker does need a little bit of time, it would appear, for Cleanse to get used to. Not quite recognizing nor respecting the full engage potential of Lucent here as he just dashes on in, uses that slow, manages to bide that Stridebreaker and get Jinx slammed into the wall. Really good recognition of your engage range and seeing how far you can get on top of this Jinx, recognizing that is the carry and You know that you've got the support, right? You know Rakan can dash through two of his allies to get into the back line. You know that Hecarim has the onslaught of shadows. If you find the engage, it doesn't matter if your team aren't immediately with you because you know that they can get there incredibly quickly. And Cleanse, stepping just a little too far forward, does pay the price. Now, we are looking to see if Miami can continue this snowball here. Got themselves a fairly decent gold lead already with that 5k margin. And we're actually seeing, I was curious about the Ezreal Mythics. I've heard rumors here, Cole, about this one. It's going to be the Lyandri's Ezreal coming on through here in game number one. Yeah, that's, that's kind of an interesting pickup for him. Ezreal, of course, actually has fantastic AP scaling. Uh, he has a ratio on his W, R, E, and Q, I believe. Yep. He might not have it on one spell, but particularly his R and uh, W have really solid AP ratios, and he can do a lot of damage by connecting with those abilities. Um, and of course, Leandry's burn. It's just good. Uh, in any case, we see these two teams coming up towards top lane. The split push has drawn everyone. It's not so much a split push. It's more of a everyone in the family comes and push or defends against it. So <laughs> the red side jungle is now the battleground while the two mid laners split push and bot. Doesn't look like we're going to fight over anything, though. It looks like 8-Bit content to say, you know what? You guys got us. You've got the pressure here, and we're not going to throw our base away by contesting a red buff. So they'll back off and go back to wave clear. Cleanse as well needs to needs to start to just tighten up a little bit, right? It was one mistake. Can't harbor on him too much, right? We all make mistakes in games. And now for the future team fights, see if we can maybe see these team fight lines drawn a little bit better. I don't think we've actually seen a good engage from 8-bit come on out seemingly at all, right? We talked about this massive team fight composition that they've drafted for themselves. Remember the second dragon when Miami had themselves a 2-3 split around the river? Made it nearly impossible 
for them to for 8-bit to try and collapse into a nice coordinated area that Miami had pushed on in through and if we get themselves or if 8-bit find themselves in a position where they can find those engages that's when that team composition is really going to come to full force when they've got the fight lines drawn Jinx Oriana in the back line have that Udi at Shogath Rel in the front line make IBN try to cut through this very beefy front line that you've drafted for yourself here with little to no damage to get through tanks necessarily yet built up Obviously, when that Lyandris comes through, it's an entirely different story. But we still have a decent window of opportunity for this to happen as Sina, he's just gone. Yeah, that is an Oriana pushed a little too far up. You see the Shockwave turns into a Sombrero, MLBD baits it out expertly and then goes back in. There is nothing Sina can do to get out of that one going to fall. Now the attention goes on to Thirst, who's engaged on, zooms away, no. <laughs> but Twins is the one who falls. There's just so much incidental damage. They realize the Jinx is low and they can kill her too. The Dizzle now has to run out of here. That is three kills all of a sudden picked up by Miami University. Like nothing. They just generated those kills. And now they're going to run their way onto the Baron. The Jungler is dead. The Marksman is dead. Baron should be theirs for the taking. And you can tell, right, this is the power of that Hecker in B1 pick, just absolutely dominating the Jinx. Underneath her own turret there, has a false sense of safety with the Udia in the front line. MLBD just rampages through into the back line, takes her back into the team, and she falls before she's even able to burn the flash. Baron going to be the prize here, and really, Miami, they're taking game one to eight bit. They had themselves a really strong top side in a winning lane, but it's all been this Hecarim. 12 out of 14 kill participation here, playing to the bot lane in the early game, playing to the rest of the map for the duration after the fact, and getting a nice little Baron for themselves as well. We're only 22 minutes in here, and they're already looking to try and siege down the base. Yep, and we also have this dragon spawning in 25 seconds. 8-bit were here first. They were able to set up while Miami University were securing the Baron. You see them setting a bush trap. They're going to knock up MLBD. They're going to see what they can do. He's at half health. The Shockwave going to get him even lower. But the Arcane Barrage knocks oh through three. My. The Ulsa of the Shadows goes through three as well. Miami University just turning this fight onto 8-bit. They're just so much stronger. It looked like a pick, and all of a sudden, their entire team is dead. 8-bit going to get aced. They're going to lose that dragon, and with Baron on the side of Miami University, they're going to start pushing down and cracking open the 8-bit base. Yeah, I just leave Lucent to take away that dragon. It's really not too much of an issue for them here. The rest of the team can try and march on through the base. An inhibitor may be up for grabs at the very least, an inhibitor turret to be set up here. And the beauty, of course, of such a clean team fight is that your team don't really need to base right here. They're not in a particular worry to make anything happen. You know, they're not too low on their health, nor mana pulls, because that team fight was over so, so quickly. They can continue their siege after they've picked up the dragon, after they've picked up the kills. You can even see them just paying a little bit of respect, able to go back if they want to spend their gold, they can. But honestly, even with the situation they're in right now, they've got time to go back and still have another siege in lieu of that Baron. Yeah, you see, they, they pick up a couple turrets, they pick up an ace, they pick up the dragon and they say, well, we just got so much gold. Why not reset? They've got enough time on this Baron left that they're going to be able to push with Baron for a little while uh, before that wears off, even after resetting a second time. So they're able to get that mid middle inhibitor exposed. Now they're going to start pushing it down once again. And I mean, at this point, Rude Dude, they're up 11k gold. They've mm -hmm. just shown, I mean, how, much, how many resources did 8-Bit sink into trying to kill MLBD there? Like, it was... Chogath Rupture into Udyr Stun, into all of Oriana's combo, into a feast, and just, he was fine. He lived, yep. and then he re-engaged. That's, that's off the back of, obviously, Rakan Karma shielding, and then all yeah. of the support that Lucent was able to pull through here for the sort of tanking it up. And it comes largely down to the fact that Cleanse is still working on his second item here, where you can see that IBN has got himself his third. There's just a massive disparity between not only the tanks here, but the damage that is coming out from these carries. I want to just quickly touch on our little item paths right now, because Pluto has opted into the Staff of Flowing Water, obviously second, which is a very traditional item when going for the this moonstone build but gives a new little passive here they've removed something and given it that ability haste as well removing the damage that you get in favor of making it even better for Ezreal right here the fact that he's able to not only have 20 from the staff of flowing water has lucidity boots has essence reaver and on top of that the lyandri's passive is giving him an extra 
10, 15 ability haste as well, just for completing items here. This guy's pumping out Mystic Shots at such an incredible rate that he can just keep going. Well, here's the engage. Calcite was looking for it, wasn't quite able to find it. Now it's the counter engage. There's just a tree hitting. Shockwave connect that's actually going to leave Miami relatively low on health, but Ivian is still pumping out the damage. This Ezreal hurts so bad. We'll see what he can do. He's going to pick up Thirst. He's now running away from Senna. He has the shield from Pluto. He's still just doing so much damage. So despite the fact Ooh. they're going to get Wombooed on, he just sniping kills, mystic shot after mystic shot. And I mean, it's a three for three, but Ivan has the health. Pluto has the health. These two can keep pushing. There's nothing that Cleanse and Cynic can do about these two. And that should be another inhibitor. Yeah, this is the, the mid AD carry duo, the uh, sort of battle that we've been looking for. Cynic and Cleanse going to be able to go back to the fountain and pick themselves up more resources and defend their top sided inhibitor. And you did get to see a bit of a glimpse here of what 8 bit are looking to do with their team fight here, with Cleanse free hitting from the backside, Cynic as well, fairly untouched during that team fight, and a little bit of over aggression coming on out from Miami U. They do overextend underneath the turret, have that wailing on them pretty consistently with Jinx with this true damage. Now completing the LDR as well here. Lord Dominix has been picked up. Cleanse will be able to cut through loose and cut through MLBD just a little bit faster right now with that Kraken Slayer also providing some nice true damage. But for the time being, they are still going to be down a very substantial amount of gold. That was only a small step up is what a very difficult mountain to climb. Yeah, I mean, you have to think that really kind of was the ideal fight for 8-bit. It was... Yeah. Lucid, MLBD, and Cleave all went in, and then they all just got CC'd for so long underneath the turret. They got hit by the Cho'Gath Rupture, they got hit by the Shockwave, they were in a Magnet Storm, they were stunned by Thirst here and there, and the whole time Glenn's was just hitting them and hitting them and hitting them. And even then, despite how perfect that was for 8-bit, it turns into a 3 for 3 where they have shorter health bars and have to back off at the end of the fight. So, I mean... You what just you need do? more of that, and you just need to wait, <laughs> yeah. right? The only thing you can do is try and turtle, install, and wait for this gold lead to be a little less steep than it is. If you can just farm up, stay chill, 11k gold deficit, huge when the teams are at 50 and 40k. Not as big of a deal when you're at 60 and 70 or 70 and 80. And that, I think, is the, the only way they have a chance, is they just need to keep finding fights like that over and over and over again to stall out AOH and see if maybe eventually those fights start going their way even harder. But like you said, it's a very tall mountain to climb. They're down an inhibitor. They've lost their top lane inhibitor turret. MUOH going to begin piling these dragons, this ocean dragon, uncontestable, going to put them on soul point. That means that there is a bit of a timer here. Five more minutes until that soul comes on through, presuming, of course, that 8-Bit aren't able to take a fight. And with the Baron on the table as well, Nyudi are down on the bot side. This is very much the wrong area of the jungle for you to be in with such a big objective on the map. For Thirst, obviously, if he goes in and steals it, then that is very worthwhile to try and sacrifice himself just to prevent this big endgame buff coming on through because it's pretty much what Miami need to get themselves back into the base and be able to set up properly for a siege down on those turrets on the inhibitors as well with mid lane inhibitor coming up fairly soon here as well the pressure from these mid lane waves is going to start to subside a little bit here not going to be all that present with less super minions spawning in and making the minion waves a little bit easier for the jinx and for the rest of the squad to manage obviously the baron's still ready still waiting to go here but as soon as it gets started up you have to imagine this is when 8-bit have to strike now remember the contest here is very good. They have got Cho'Gath and they have got an Udi. Look at the engage already. Yeah, here comes a very fast engage. MLBD and Cleave just running everyone down. They're able to find the Jinx. They're able to find Cleanse. And that means that this is going to be a route. You see Cinna having to flash for the heals. And Nizzle goes in trying to do what he can. But his damage is gone. They have all fled. And that means it's going to be a wipe. It's going to be three for zero in favor of MUOH. They're going to keep chasing this down, see if they can get more MLBD diving Nexus turrets. The waves are here, and I uh, rude, dude, I think this is going to be game. They're able to keep pushing with this big wave they've got in top lane. Yeah, without the Baron, it might be a little difficult against Ori, but at the end of the day, they can end up just diving if they so desire. First Nexus turret up for grabs, second one falling. This is going to be it. 
Yeah, and that is a statement game one here from Miami University Red Hawks. They are dominant in this game. They take a huge lead. They have an 11-1-11 Ezreal in a 30-minute game. They look dominant. They look powerful. They gave up a couple early dragons, and after that, they just slammed the door shut. Gave up almost nothing the rest of the way. Closed the game out in just over 30 minutes. Incredibly strong performance from Miami U there. Sacrificing the early two objectives that they didn't necessarily need here. And you can tell that they didn't need it, right? The way they were able to dominate during the mid and late game stages. That Cloud Dragon, that Mountain Dragon, who even remembers that they went over to 8-bit esports here. Giving up those objectives. And that allowed them to get gold across the rest of the map. Allowed them to take better fights, more advantageous positions for them. And you're talking about the 1 11, uh, the 11, 1, 11 Ezreal here. My eyes are on Pluto, 0, 0, 20 on a mid lane Harmer. Absolute <laughs> yeah. support kingdom coming out of the mid lane. <laughs> yeah, that's the beauty of the, the Moonstone Staff Ardent Karma, right? Is you you don't need to press Mantra Q. You don't need to press Mantra W. It's just a Sivir ult on like a <laughs> 20 second cooldown that comes with a big shield and ability haste and attack speed and on hit damage for everyone. You press that ability, you buff your team up so much. It came in clutch in so many different instances. It was part of what kept MLBD alive during that kind of bushwhack in the bot side jungle. And it's a big part of what allowed them to kind of close that game out. Just give that movement speed, give that power to the team. And I mean... Miami University took advantage of it. They went through, they ran over 8-bit. They used their draft to its fullest. I mean, you saw them zooming in for that final engage, too. They just found cleanse, and there was nothing 8-bit could do to keep that Jinx alive when the Hecarim and the Rakan got on top of her. So that is a big win for them. That's going to put them 1-0 up in this series. But this is a best of five, so we have plenty of League of Legends left to go. 8-bit have plenty of time to adapt to change, to figure out what they could do differently to try and make this a series. So we're going to take a quick break and go to a pause while we wait to get into draft for game two. We'll be back in just a few moments. Don't go anywhere.